When you think of Lemmy, the next words that come to mind should be martial amplifiers and Rickenbacker basses. And while you're not wrong, have you ever stopped to think about Lemmy's other basses? Lemmy? Other basses? Let's find out. Ian Lemmy of Fiverr Kilmerstadt has stated pretty much every opportunity that he is not a bass player. He is a guitar player who plays bass. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about Lemmy and his humble upbringing with the electric guitar. But if you want to skip ahead to the bass guitars, you can do so by clicking forward to the time shown on screen now. No doubt some people have skipped ahead. Can I ask you guys a huge favour? In the comments down below, write something to the tune of, oh my god, I can't believe Lemmy had that guitar. Let's check the comments and I have to go back to find out what it is they missed. I'm a child at heart. Much of Lemmy's past prior to Motorhead involved him playing the electric guitar. Originally it was his mother who kindled him with the curiosity of music. On the wall in his childhood home was a Hawaiian steel guitar. Apart from the general curiosity however, Lemmy would later admit he did it all to impress the chicks. As Lemmy grew, he joined various bands over the years. The main ones of interest were the Sundowners and the DJs. It was in these bands that Lemmy used a Hofner Club 50 guitar. In 1962, Lemmy left his childhood home of Stoke-on-Trent for the city of Manchester. Here, he soon joined a band called the Motown Sect and was in possession of an Echo 40V guitar. He wasn't much of a fan of this guitar and soon swapped it for a Harmony Meteor. This soon fell out of favour and was soon traded for a Gibson 330. In his autobiography, Lemmy reminisces and regrets trading the Meteor. Following the Motown sect, Lemmy joined the Rocking Vickers, who made good with a few successful singles and toured Eastern Europe. He would stay with the Vickers for just over two years, from 1965 to 1967. The band communally owned a Fender Jazzmaster, which they would all share. Lemmy at this time owned a Fender Telecaster after, you guessed it, trading in his 330. He then decided to modify the group's Jazzmaster, adding the Telecaster neck onto the body of the Jazzmaster. According to Lemmy, that was a wonderful guitar and I played it right through my time with the Vickers. When I left, I had to give them the jazz body back. At this point in time, Lemmy spent the next few months working as a roadie for Jimi Hendrix before playing in the British psychedelic rock band Sam Gopal. Subsequently, over the next few years, Lemmy would spend his time dossing in squat houses, with his guitar slowly collecting dust hung up on the wall. But all that would end in the year 1971, where Lemmy would meet Hawkwind's Michael Dick Mick Davis. And that means the bass guitar people should be joining us any minute now. Oh, we weren't talking about you skipping forward, by the way. So, uh, bass guitars. Lemmy's bass career officially starts with Hawkwind. In his autobiography, White Line Fever, Lemmy declares that the day he joined Hawkwind was the first time he ever played bass. The story of how Lemmy got stuck playing bass is almost the stuff of legend. The band had a show that day in London, and bassist at the time, Dave Anderson, didn't show up. The bass player, who never showed up at three concerts, and this was one of them, left his bass in the van. Like, you know, st please steal my gig. So I stole his gig. Destiny, destiny, can't avoid it, that's for me. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I think it's just dumb luck. The bass Lemmy picked up was his first running with a Rickenbacker bass. Unfortunately, he had to deal with the fact that this bass didn't belong to him. He, of course, borrowed it for the occasion and had to give it back to its rightful owner sooner or later. As a result, Lemmy then bought his very own bass off of Dale Detmer, synth player in Hawkwind, a Hopf bass from Germany, resembling a Gibson SG and made famous in a music video, Silver Machine, in 1972. Most notably, this bass was bought in a luggage auction at Heathrow Airport. Lemmy admitted he still owed Dale 27 quid for it. In today's money, that would be £338, or just over $400. It's been suggested that the Hoff bass was stolen, which paved the way for Lemmy using a Rickenbacker. Lemmy's very first Rickenbacker was a 4000 model, which he heavily modified. That may come as a surprise to some, but let's take a look at the details. You could argue this bass to be a Rickenbacker 4001S, which came with two pickups and a dotted inlay as standard. However, when you compare the placement controls to the 4001S model, you'll notice they don't sit the same. They are slightly further apart. Take a look at the screw placement too. This tone knob sits in front of the screw on the 4000, 
while it's behind in the 4001S. The pickup toggle switch is also in a different place. So what exactly happened to this base? Well, there's hardly any photos of it pre-mod, which is a real shame. In some interviews, the base was described as being salmon pink, and Lemmy sanded off the color, giving it a quilted maple look. When we do see pictures of the base in the mid 70s, it now has four pot controls and a Thunderbird pickup in the neck. From my research, it's been suggested that on some Rickenbacker 4000 models, you can remove the pick guard and find a cavity for a neck pickup and routing already pre-cut, meaning Rickenbacker ship 4000s and 4001Ss identically, but left out the Ricker sound and the additional pickups on the 4000. An interesting trait of Lemmy's was that he loved to tinker with his equipment, hot rodding his amplifiers, which we'll get to shortly, and customizing his bases, changing their aesthetics with stickers, hardware, and tone control knobs. With this bass in particular, it's been seen with so many stickers and modifications and refurbishments, it could be mistaken for a different bass all together. A full list of the sticker updates and the hardware changes can be found in the show notes link down below. Otherwise, if I list them all, we'll be here all day and you and I have better things to talk about. A recognizable sticker would be a very small Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe. A recognizable sticker would be a very small Luftwaffe eagle on the lower horn, typically seen in Hawkwind, and a rice shadler on a shield on the upper horn in Motorhead. You can also identify this bass by the progression of the string guides on the headstock. Disclosed in Lemmy's autobiography, he describes how some strings slip out of the nut. A friend then added a string bar, holding down the strings in place. Over the years, this rick had a straight nut bar, stop snickering at the back, and two circular disc trees holding down the strings. The bass later also had a stencil that spelt out, Kiss my ass. Which was first seen in 1981. Following this on tour in 1995, a new stencil emerged. Motherfucker One. After the tour, this bass was pretty much retired and last seen in a Rickenbacker factory tour dated 2009. In the video, Lemmy's bass is in shop for another refurbishment. With all the hardware removed, we can see the skeleton of the bass. We can see the hollowed and filled remains of a Ricker sound in this angle, as well as a crack made when the bass was said to be dropped by a disgruntled roadie. And of course, you could hardly miss the cutout for a Thunderbird pickup. Lemmy also played with a Gibson Thunderbird 2 at the tail end of Hawkwind, before it was reported stolen. As we all know, Lemmy was kicked out of Hawkwind for doing the wrong drugs. As a result, Motorhead was born and played their very first gig in July 1975. He used his very first Rickenbacker exclusively right up to 1979. Thereon, he bought a brand new Rickenbacker 4001 which would feature the Ace of Spades sticker. It's white with black binding and also seen on a collection of music video releases from 1981. Notably, Motorhead, Overkill, No Class, and Bomber. Much of the 4001 remains stock, apart from upgrading the pickup. There's much to say about pickups and we'll get to that later on. Also making a debut in 1981 was the arrival of a third Rickenbacker with a maple body and dotted inlay neck. It's commonly known as the Born to Lose Out to Lunch Bass. It also raises some controversy. At the time, Rickenbacker didn't make basses with maple necks. No doubt there were some custom options, but it wasn't stock as of yet. It's been said that Lemmy bought this bass off a friend and its original state remains a mystery. According to Lemmy, when he first got the bass, it already had the maple fingerboard, but the frets were pulled out and in need of repair. He also points out that the headstock had a bunch of holes in them from previous tuner keys being installed. It did have a ricker sound, however, so it looks like an original rick that was modified. Footage of this bass shows a skunk stripe down the back of the neck, meaning it could have started its life out as a 4001. However, as the years passed, this bass was heavily customized and refurbished on at least three different occasions. Not only was the bass cleaned up, different knobs were added like a kitchen cooker knob and chicken head knobs. Even the jack socket was moved from the bottom to the front of the bass. You'll recognize stickers on this bass such as the iron cross on the body and the black stars on the inlays. This was Lemmy's main tour base from 1981 to 1995, making appearances on BBC's The Young Ones. Oh! Oh, wow! <coughs> yeah! Oh, I just remembered what it was I had to tell you! <laughs> One track Mind, Shine, and I Got Mine. 
It was last seen in 2003 at the Motorhead Walk of Fame induction. Around 1984, a Rickenbacker 4003 was spotted briefly on tour. It features a sticker of cartoon character Wimpy from the Popeye series. It was seen again, freshened up in the 1995 music video Sacrifice. Now, I'll admit, it does look similar to the 4001. However, this base appears to be quilted and have a white binding, where the 4001 is white with a black binding. I personally find it hard to believe he would take the colour off this base, only to have it reapplied again in the future. If you know different, let me know in the comments. In 1995, Rickenbacker paid tribute to Lemmy with his very own custom base. It features a hand-carved walnut body, maple neck, rosewood fingerboard, gold hardware, and a white checkered binding. It also features three of Rickenbacker's newest humbucker ones, which is not a particularly original name for a pickup. Nonetheless, it was met with Lemmy's approval. Lemmy used this base exclusively up until his passing in 2015. There was a very short period during 2005 where this base disappeared, and in its place was a second custom model. Based on an early Rickenbacker 4004C, it was gold coloured with an ornate leaf edge, just two HB1 pickups, and had a motorhead style Reichsadler. On the back of Lemmy's custom base in 2001, Rickenbacker then sold up to 60 limited edition signature models, all with the same hardware as the man himself. I envy you people, I do. And now, just to finish bases, we have a miscellaneous list. The following bases have been seen on stage, in a video, or in a photo. No doubt there's always going to be the oddball base that crops up sooner or later that isn't mentioned here. Nonetheless, they haven't been cemented into Lemmy's rig, and aren't that relevant in the great scheme of things. Check the show notes if you want to see the whens, the whats, and the wheres. I'm also including some pictures of Lemmy's side project, Headcap, as there wasn't any major deviations from his gear, but it's just worth including. These stock Rickenbackers pictured have seen some use, but only with a couple of appearances. There's nothing else special about them, so we'll move on. In the book, Motorhead in the Studio, the producer Trevor Halsey said a five-string bass was used on the recording of Bomber in 1979. This is the only reference I've come across of Lemmy using a five-string bass. However, Lemmy himself denounced his five strings outright in an interview with Joel McIver. If we go back and take another look at the book, it notes Lemmy using an eight-string bass. So this has got to be a typo. What's up with that? Speaking of eight string basses. Motorhead played the UK's Top of the Pops. Lem was playing an eight string Hagstrom. One interview with a Motorhead roadie in 2011 stated Hendrix gave Lemmy an eight string bass. Some believe the bass in this video is the same one that Hendrix used. However, Lemmy would later admit in a separate interview, I have an eight string bass. It's the same one that Hendrix had. Now, I may be splitting hairs here, but he doesn't technically say it's the one Hendrix played. If you look really close enough, the colours don't match either. Lem's is more of a burst colour, and Hendrix is red. Your mileage may vary. The 1982 Iron Fist tour programme showed Lemmy using a Washburn B20. The B20 crops up amidst Lemmy's first and Maple bases in the publication. And back to TV appearances in 1987, Lemmy uses an early Gibson Thunderbird 4 in the movie Eat the Rich. This bass was used on a few shows at the time, and eventually sold to Dimebag Daryl of Pantera. During the World Is Yours tour in 2014, there were brief appearances of a Gibson SG bass, as well as a Minaric Inferno. Minaric would also go on to develop a signature model for Lemmy, using the Medusa model. This was seen primarily in promotional photos during the recording of Bad Magic. Now I know what you're thinking. No, 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 not that. Why would Lem play this over his custom Rickenbacker? Lemmy has always stated that he chooses basses over their looks and not their sound. So I can see Lemmy giving this a shot. According to Minaric, Lemmy was in on this from day one and fully approved the build. However, before his untimely death, it seems that all progress has stopped and there hasn't been an update in years. And finally, still on the topic of bad magic, a photo surfaced of Lemmy using a Burns Bison bass. With bases done, 
Let's move on to amplifiers. The Ampeg thing can go fuck for a start. Lemmy's amplifiers are extremely straightforward. Lemmy used a Selma treble and bass, which was a popular British amp in the 60s. Lemmy mentions in his autobiography that he had a broken amplifier around 1974. In replacement of the Selma, he got a Marshall JMP Super Bass Mark II. He would own several of these heads over his career and adorn them with their own distinctive names and personalities. All of the heads were constantly tinkered with and hot rodded, meaning some modifications were made to the internal circuitry to accentuate certain traits. His first amps were early Mark IIs from the 1970s, aptly named Marsha or Vroom and De Hammer or simply Hammer. Something to note but not detrimental to the sound was the addition of newer Mark IIs. They were manufactured in the later half of the 70s. Essentially, they're the same amplifier but with newer rocker switches over the toggles. These amps were named No Morals, or Killer, Moot, or later Moo, as the T had fallen off, No Remorse, Exorcist, and the most famous of all, Murder One. That's my A-level drama cropping up again. Throughout Motorhead, he would mix and match the heads. Again, take a look at the show notes to see a full list of which amplifier was used during what period. Murder One first made an appearance in 1994. By 2006, Marshall would recreate Murder One with their own signature series bass amp. These Murder One signatures copied the existing modifications and updated the electronics, giving Lemmy a consistent and reliable performance night after night. The signature, model name 1992LEM or LEM, followed Lemmy on his 2007 world tour. The amplifier was so successful, Lemmy then replaced his existing amplifiers and used the 1992LEM almost exclusively. In some performances, the original Murder One would sit on stage, and opposite that would be a signature head. In the final years of Motorhead, you can usually spot a pair of 1992 lems by the five-pointed Russian military stars inside ornate golden reefs. Unlike the original Murder One, however, the signatures are missing the nameplate. These names are only reserved for the big man. On some occasions, it wasn't unheard of for Lemmy to be using older looking Mark IIs, the ones with the toggle switches. It's uncertain whether they were made just for him or originals. They would either be left blank or just have the classic white Marshall logo. It's also unlikely these are his refurbished originals. Take a look at one of the final Motorhead shows. You'll see Marsha and Hammer both on stage in their original state. Moving on to cabinets. In every photo I've seen of Lemmy and Hawkwind, he always had Marshall cabinets and used them straight from the get-go. In Hawkwind, they were painted with trippy psychedelic colors using fluorescent day glow paint. Once Motorhead was underway, they were painted flat black. His cabinets were an original Marshall 4x12 guitar cab, which sat on top of a monster Marshall 4x15. The 15 inch cab has an interesting origin. Lemmy recites the story in an interview with John McIver, where he bought a pair of them essentially brand new in America. Lemmy would double down with these cabinets and have two 4x12s and two 415s. These four cabinets would largely remain unchanged, apart from the odd spot of ornaments, stickers and name pieces. Around the early 2000s, there was some footage of Lemmy using different cabs. The easiest assumption is that Lemmy had an A-Rig and a B-Rig, which is something he's hinted at in the past. He would keep his A-Rig in Europe and his B-Rig in North America. Both are identical, except for the named heads. You can usually spot his original cabinets by the use of decorations, like hardware and white tape down the edges of the rig, as well as the bare speaker grills. On European days, you'll also notice new cabs, like four Marshall 1960 4x12s, replacing his 15s outright. At first, I thought these cabs were rented. You can only imagine the logistical nightmare of shipping gear back and forth to different countries on time. There's a strong case for rental equipment in the early 2000s. Amplifiers like the VBA 400 appear once and are never seen again. Following this, there's the arrival of brand new stock Marshall equipment. New looking heads with clean cabs and fresh grill cloth. If you know anything about Lemmy's cabs, you'll know they've never had a grill cloth. You also notice he doesn't personalize them the way he once did. However, as the months went on and the tour settled down, some of the stock gear would remain a permanent fixture and stuck around until 2006. Whilst there was a very brief window where the 15s were reunited, that wouldn't last long. 
It was around the same time that Marshall were refining their Murder One signature head. They state in the brochure that testing took place on the road during the 2007-8 World Tour. They also released signature cabinets at the same time, so there's a high possibility that the clean looking stock heads and cabs were test signatures. And that would explain some of the inconsistencies in Lemmy's gear. As I've mentioned, the signature head was a success with Lemmy, and the cabinets were no different. Depending on where in the world Motorhead was, Lemmy would use a mixture of his OG rig or the modern signature. This arrangement would stick with him and the band right up until the end. Pickups are an interesting topic I'd like to expand on. Lemmy has always disliked the original stock Rickenbacker pickup, famously saying you could always improve the tone of the bass after you bought it. In this case, he decided to put original chrome Thunderbird pickups in his very first bass. Whilst he did like it, he was still on the lookout for something better. He experimented further, adding a black Thunderbird 4 on this bass and the Out to Lunch bass. Out to Lunch was further upgraded with a Bartolini soap bar pickup before eventually setting on a stock Rickenbacker HB1. The HB1s can also be found on Lemmy's 4004 LK custom models. It would seem Rickenbacker had finally caught up to Lemmy's ultra high expectations. As Lemmy put simply, they're good now. Further experimentation can be seen on Lemmy's Blackbound 4001 with an added Damasio pickup. He also mentions using a Fender pickup, but didn't say which bass or which Fender pickup. In December 2014, a Lemmy signature pickup was released by Seymour Duncan. Following this at the Winter Nam show one month later, VP of Engineering Kevin Bella explains Lemmy and his management approached them to create a signature pickup. According to Bella, I'm going to tell you a little bit about these pickups that we made for Lemmy Kilmeister from, uh, from Iron Maiden. So Lemmy and his management approached us to come up with a set of pickups that captured his sound. The pickup that he had in his base, the spacing was so narrow that he was missing the outside strings. The pickups created for Lemmy were optimized to specifically address string placement issues. They also made a consumer version, still available today, which fits more in line with traditional Rickenbacker string spacing and housing. These pickups were released 12 months before Lemmy's passing. If you take a look at the final Motorhead shows of 2015, you'll notice Lemmy never once uses these pickups. I wrote to Seymour Duncan and asked them why that would be the case. And despite some subtle nudging and pestering on my part, they didn't get back to me. Lemmy has hinted at using Roto Sound strings in the early days, before moving on to D Markley Blue Steels in 1993. He expressed in an interview that string selection isn't really a big deal in the great scheme of things, as he came from a generation where you used what you had. In summer 2012, Dunlop released their very own Lemmy signature string set, essentially taking the advantages from the Blue Steels and creating a Dunlop version. Lem used the Dunlop signatures right up to his last performance, as stated in the bass player's The Final Interview. Finally, on to effects, or rather the lack of them. Kilmerstar proudly states to never using effects. His sound comes from hitting the amplifier as hard as possible. He admits in an interview he once tried a wah-wah pedal, but it wasn't to his liking. In the same interview, Lemmy reveals his amplifier settings. Presence is at three o'clock, bass is off, middle is full, treble is off, and volume at three o'clock. He says it gives him a little bit of a lift. Take a look at the show notes to see the full details of everything mentioned in today's video. I've had so much fun making this video, I really hope you guys have enjoyed it too. If you're new to the channel, leave me a comment down below and just say hello. The channel has finally hit 10,000 subscribers, so I know you're out there. I still have many, many players yet to cover on this channel. So please subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out on the next video. Keep an eye out for an update video soon to follow. And we have another community vote. I'm thinking of polling someone like Geddy Lee, David Elson, Tim Comerford, John Myung, or maybe even Peter Steele. You just have to wait and see. Not a fan of those guys? Well, you know the drill by now. Leave me a comment and tell me who you do want to see. The more requests I get, the sooner your choice will appear. My thanks go out to Anton for helping me with the research of this video. Go say hi to him on Twitter. Thank you very much, dude. And also, thank you. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you in the next Know Your Bass Player. Keep an eye out for that update video.